So hello everyone. So again, thank you very much to attend our this week Rockers in Fusion AI seminar talk. And today we're glad to have the Dr. Wen, uh, Wei Wen from Facebook AI Research to give us this talk. So Dr. Wen is a currently a research scientist at Facebook AI. He received his PhD degree from Duke University and his research area is deep learning with recent focus on automated machine learning efficient deep neural networks and distributed deep, deep learning. So before joining the Facebook intern at Google Brain, Facebook AI, Microsoft Research, and HP Labs. So Dr. Wen is very well known for his seminar two works. One is the structured sparsity work that has already been integrated in the current Intel's new network and distiller, right? Right. Yeah. And another is the, his works on the distributed training. I think that work, that algorithm is already being integrated in the, right now, the Facebook's PY Torch. So right now, every day when we use the PY Torch, actually we will leverage his very uh, seminar approach to accelerate our training. So now let's welcome Dr. Wen to give us this talk. The efficient deep learning on automated design, distributed training, and the edge inference. Thanks, Paul. Hi everyone, I'm away from Facebook. So today I'm going to share uh, my research on uh, efficient deep learning. And uh, in this whole talk, I will, I will include a lot of work that was done uh, with collaborators from different, a lot of institutes. So here um, is the like research overview from the uh, perspective for deep learning pipeline. So um, when we design or uh, when we do deep learning, the first thing is we need to design our architecture. And then we'll train it. And of course, our final goal is to deploy it. And however, because the deep learning model is pretty large, each stage here is pretty slow, actually. So for new architecture search, is, uh, for new architecture design is slow um, because when training the model is slow and we have to train we have to try a lot of like options uh, to tune the architectures and the like uh, hyperparameters for training. And the training is slow as mentioned and the inference is slow because the model is pretty large. So basically my research is more on the efficiency of the deep learning. So I'll, in this talk, I will share um, um, my one research on each stage to make, to make each stage faster. Uh, so first thing is on the importance of the efficiency for neural architecture search. So um, as I mentioned, we have a, a lot of um, architecture options when we design a deep learning model. And we human, uh, when the search space is too large, we human cannot design, we human cannot um, search a lot of options. Usually we heuristically to like try a few options and select the a sub, a sub optimal option. And however, recent uh, research on neural architecture search or NAS in short, show that NAS can surpass its human experts in like image classification problem and the detection problems. So uh, if we, if deep model, if modern deep learning shift human effort from feature engineering to architecture engineering, then the emerging neural architecture search is shifting human effort from architecture engineering to a simple search space engineering. So if we just design a search space and let the um, NAS method to design the model for us. Um, however, um, I mean, NAS is a good approach to liberate human efforts, however, NAS is still pretty slow in terms of the computation cost of the machines. So I'll introduce one of, one of my research to make NAS faster. So second is only efficiency for the uh, distributed deep learning. So as I mentioned again, again, the rise of AI basically comes from the ability to train larger and larger models. This is typically true in the natural language processing field, especially uh, represented by OpenAI's GPT model. 
recently. So this figure basically uh, shows that if they scale the model size, they simply get a larger, or they simply get a higher accuracy. So long thing, so long thing magic here just scale up the model. This shows the importance of the scale of deep learning. However, the problem here is when we train on uh, those large models, the training process will be pretty slow. Um, because um, we have a lot of machines, then we need to do the synchronization across lots of machines. Then the communication is the bottleneck of scaling up. So it's a problem in cloud servers and it's more of a problem in recent federated learning settings because um, in federated learning, the communication bandwidth is even slower because it's usually like Wi-Fi bandwidth instead of uh, high speed in cloud server, cloud in the cloud. So last, last is on the importance of the efficiency for inference. So um, when we build a, of a model, the eventual, eventual goal is to deploy the model to edge devices like self-driving car, a VR devices, or mobile phone or home devices. Usually those devices have like pretty limited compute memory and the battery budget. When the model is too large, then the inference speed will be slow Then it will be challenging to deploy them to edge devices. So that's the problem of deep learning. And uh, yeah, so my research is more on efficiency. So I'll introduce one of my research on each um, aspect to make each stage faster. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to like stop me. So first stage on Okay, yeah, the first is on neural architecture search, a uh, neural predictor for neural architecture search. So first, uh, what's neural architecture search? So the goal of neural architecture search or NAS in short, the goal is to autom automatically find good models in a search space. So here is a like, simple figure to show what's NAS. So we have a sampler or agent it was sample uh, some models from a search space. So, and those sampled models will go through an accuracy evaluator. So the val evaluator will give accuracy feedback to our sampler or agent so it can sample better and better models. And uh, basically for my research on neural predictor, on um, it's on this aspect, we build a predictor to predict accuracy given the, uh, given the architecture of the uh, new network. So it, it can give, uh, it can predict accuracy. And the goal of new predictor is to speed up uh, this process. And here is the overview of new predictor. So first, uh, we need to build the new predictor. So here is how we build it. Uh, first, we have a like, search space. And we first sample a few models from the search space. And then we train and validate a them from scratch. So we, get, we can get a small data set. Um, and each data basically is one pair of the architecture and it's ground truth accuracy. Then we can use a predictor. We can build a predictor to predict accuracy using this data set. After we have this uh, neural predictor, then this is how we use it. And uh, again, we have the same search space. We run the sample many models and like tons of models. Then we use the neural predictor to predict the accuracy for four tons of models. Then we can pick top K models with top K predicted accuracy. Then we can train and validate them from scratch. Then we pick the best validation model for final 
deployment. Hi, Wei, I have a question. Yeah. So we pick the samples in the search space. Uh, what are some good algorithms to pick the samples? Um, yeah, uh, there are a lot of like sampling method. Uh, in this work, we simply use the random search, but we could use other like reinforcement learning, um, patient optimization or evolutionary algorithm. Yeah. I see. Uh, but in, when we do the search, um, some problems may have high dimension and also some problems may have, you know, conventional continuous variable and discrete variables. So uh, the difference of the mathematical formulation, we also use for the search algorithms, right? Right, right. So in this case, mostly it's discrete values because of it's the architecture of the, or it's the architecture uh, features. So like- I see. Yeah, the nice. connections and uh, one hot encoding. So I'm just gonna hear is what I will. I will see. Yes. You. Yeah. Um, yeah. So here is the here is is how we build the uh, neural predictor. So basically, we use graph convolution networks as the model, and uh, we also encode on um, our new network and um, two features. So here is how we encode it. So for example, here is a, a new network and the basically neural architecture is a, is a graph. So we can convert it to a graph and each node here is a one layer. So, and the, 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 connect, the connections between those layers basically are connections between those nodes. And um, for each node, um, it's one layer, right? So um, we encode so we use one hard encoding of the operators. So for example, so typically in this example, for each node, we only have like five options. It can be the input layer, output layer, count one by one, three by three, max pooling. Then for each layer, we can use one hard encoding. Now we have the we have the node, node representations, and we have the adjacency matrix. Then basically we have all the input for a graph convolution networks. Then we can build the uh, graph new networks on top of the features. And then we can predict the accuracy. Before I dive into new predictor, let's talk a little bit about the state of art of new architecture search methods. So for, um, for most NAS method, here is how they do the search. So those methods usually introduce a lot of hyperparameters. So uh, they have to tune those hyperparameters. So first they said the first the first first they said they use one hyperparameters and they run the search and find the model and then they change the hyperparameters and again they keep doing this until they find a good model. So the total search time should be the sum of all the runs. And this, this table just include the hyperparameters for different NAS methods. Unfortunately, um, when they compare the search time, they usually compare the search time for a single run under the best tuned hyperparameters. Um, uh, this is unfair to some algorithms because some algorithms may have uh, much fewer hyperparameters or the hyperparameters is more robust. So yeah, that's one thing I wanna mention. However, in your predictor, we don't have any hyperparameters. And so here is basically I mentioned how we build the new predictor. So we first collect the data set. And of course we have hyperparameters for new predictor. However, we can tune those hyperparameters using the data set. So we already have the data set. We don't need to re rerun any like um, training new models uh, because the new predictor is pretty small. Then tuning those hyperparameters is ignorable. So, and after we cross validate a good your predictor, then we do a single final uh, search. So we so the only hyperparameter that we might need to rerun the whole process from end to end is n 
which is uh, like the number of models that we want to train first to build the new predictor. Basically, that's the size of the data set here. I'll, I'll discuss it later. And, and the last, last aspect is on the parallelizability of NAS methods. Mm. For NAS method, NAS method based on reinforcement learning, evolutionary regression, or Bayesian optimization, they can parallelize the computation within each step. However, um, synchronization between those steps are required because they have to collect the like reward for RL fitness in uh, evolution aggregation and aggregation function in Bayesian optimization. So it cannot be fully parallelized. For weight sharing method, basically they train a super model by stochastic gradient descent. So SGD is naturally a iterative optimizer, so it cannot be fully parallelized. Uh, however, the advantage of new predictor is it's fully parallelizable. And so for the two most competition component are basically training in random models and the training top K predicted models, and they are fully parallelizable. So in summary, new predictor is hyperparameter friendly and fully parallelizable. And I will show, show soon that it's also sample efficient. So we first, we first validated it on S bench 101, which is a, a public benchmark. And in the search space, they have like half, around half a million models in the search space. So all the models, in the search space are trained from scratch. So they have the ground truth. So Google basically have a lot of machines. So they train a lot of models. And each model was trained for three times. And uh, for the search space, it's a self-best NAS search, search space. And each layer can be like count one by one, three by three, and max pulling. And he, this plot basically is the, um, Validation accuracy and the test accuracy for all the models in the search space. And one thing I want to mention is if we zoom in into this area. Um, okay, so that, that's the thing. So many papers report that they, they find the best test model with the best test accuracy. However, um, uh, when we do neural architecture search, we should, we should use the validation model. Otherwise, NAS method will overfit. So if we use validation accuracy and during the search, the, de the best model is basically this one. And it, it doesn't have the, be the best test accuracy. If, if a paper claim that they find the best test model, that means one, they may just use the test accuracy for the search, then the method can overfit. And the second is basically, uh, they are lucky to find this model. So that, that's, that, that's one thing I wanna mention here. Okay, the result. Um, okay, the figure here, basically X axis is the number of samples or models we trained and the y-axis is the uh, validation accuracy. The middle figure basically is for test accuracy instead of validation accuracy. Research on validation, and then we, uh, we can also report the test accuracy. And the red figure is the test accuracy versus the walk clock time instead of like the number of samples. So the first baseline is the Oracle, Oracle baseline, which is the upper bound baseline. Um, so here, basically, we train all the models and pick the best validation model. And the lower bound baseline is random search. And basically, we train M random models and pick the best validation model. And, uh, and another baseline is regularized evolution, uh, which is a state-of-art baseline. Um, it's the best uh, method in the original NAS Bench 1.1 paper. 
but uh, yes, the community had some progress after the publication, but it's a strong baseline here. And here basically uh, is the result of our new predictor. Um, and it's pretty uh, efficient, sample efficient comparing with uh, regularized evolution. And uh, it's like uh, 10 times as sample efficient as regularized evolution. As I mentioned before, we have one hyperparameter that we might need to tune. And uh, here is the application starting. Um, one question that we, uh, we may want to answer is, given the total number of models that we can train, let's say we have computation budget, we can only train a limited uh, number of models. Um, let's say we can only train 1,000 models. And so what's the um, optimal N? So here N basically is uh, the data set size we use to build our predictor. So that's the number of model, models we first have to train to collect the data set. Um, so K basically is the top K models we predicted and we train from scratch. So as I said, um, let's say we have a limited budget in total, we can only train n plus k models, let's say 1,000 models. So what's the optimal n here? So the conclusion here is when n is too small, for example, it's like uh, 80, 86 or even smaller, then uh, if we can totally train 1,000 1, model, then it can underperform. It's quite understandable because when n is too small, then the predictor has uh, just a small data set to train that it's not accurate to predict. However, when n is too large, it can also, also underperform. Why? Um, so let's say, for example, if we use 806 models to build a predictor, which is the uh, pinkish uh, curve here, and it, it's not the best uh, setting. Why? Uh, because um, when we have a large N, then we have a smaller K. So we can only predict a small top K models to train. Then, although we can use a little bit, we can use more data to make the predictor a little bit more accurate, but it cannot tolerate the prediction noise from the predictor because we have a small, um, top K models, so it can also underperform. So the best uh, setting is something in between. And however, um, as we can see that all N can still underperform the regularized evolution and the, um, the result is quite robust across different N values. So here is the result on ImageNet. So the search space is a proxiness search space the goal is to find fast models um, for Google uh, Pixel 1 mobile phone and with the inference time between uh, this range. Um, so, so first we need to build the predictor and uh, uh, I'll show our first or just a single search result. And uh, we didn't tune N, we just set it to uh, 120, but one flow failed. That's the weird number here. But anyway, we, we build a predictor and we train, we use the training data, data and then we cross validate it. And it can also gener generalize well to test um, samples. So in the figure X axis is the predicted accuracy, Y axis is the uh, ground truth when we train them from scratch. So, so that's, that's how we build the predictor and now is how we use it. So now we have the predictor, we randomly sample around 100K random models. Then we can use the predictor to predict their accuracy. So we, we get a lot of predicted accuracies. Then we can select the frontier because we want to make a trade-off between accuracy and the inference time. Then we can select the predicted frontier 
and we train all those frontiers, which is around 140 models, we get the ground truth of the frontier here to make the accuracy trade off with the inference time. Hi, mm. Lee, I have a question. Uh, right. So when you build the predictor, on what kind of learning model did you use? Um, it's also graph convolution networks. I see, thank you. Yeah. Mm, yeah, as you can see, our method is on par in terms of the trade-off with the proxiness method. Mm, however, um, as I mentioned, our method is pretty hyperparameter friendly, and we didn't tune any hyperparameter for new predictor. However, for proxiness, um, to reproduce the one single dot, we need to rerun like around seven searches to find a good trade-off. And um, also, a single run of proxiness nets can only produce a dot here. However, a single run of a new predictor can produce the whole curve. So that's the advantage of new predictor. I think this concludes my first part, and I'll move to the second part of distribute um, learning with um, quantization, uh, quantization on the communication. So, uh, so here is the statement on the communication bottleneck. So in stochastic gradient descent, um, in distributed training, we have our central parameter server. And the first we send the parameters to different machines or workers. And each machine will use different data to train. After each training uh, was done, then there was send the gradients back to the uh, center parameter server for synchronization. So here, uh, of course, we, we can use more machine to reduce the communication time almost, almost linearly because we have like more machine, we have, then we have more computation power. However, because we have more machine, the, then we have more communication over the network, then the communication will increase. So the total time was saturated at some point and we cannot scale up. So um, my research on my, this research is trying to reduce the communication time such that the total time can decrease and we can get a better scalability. So to make the distributed training faster. So uh, if we uh, reorganize the communication pattern a little bit, then we can only send the gradients over the network. And for gradients, it's usually in floating precision. So that's 32 bits per gradient. Uh, in this work, we do uh, quantization. We call it tenorization. So it's called tenary gradients or tangrant. So apparently tenary here means uh, three, like discrete values. Uh, so we can encode them to at most the two bits so we can reduce the communication significantly by 16 times. Mm, it will be quite challenging because it loses the precision in the training. So how, how did we achieve it? So the basic idea is stochastic gradient descent without bias. So mm, in SGD, uh, SGD works pretty well because it's our unbiased gradient descent. Okay, so in batch gradient descent, the um, parameter is updated by the average gradients from all the, all the training samples. So N here is the uh, training data set size. It's pretty large. So, so in SGD, instead of use the batch gradient, um, we use a uh, sample gradient. SGD works pretty well for deep learning because it's an unbiased gradient descent. That means the expectation of the gradient is still the original batch gradient. So that's the motivation. So why don't we also do a stochastic quantization in a way such that 
the expectation of the tenorized gradient is still the original gradient. So that so we can still get the unbiased gradient descent. So that's the motivation. And here is how we how we did it. So the left is the math formulation, the right is the example. Maybe I'll just use the example to illustrate it. So here, GT, GT is the original floating precision um, for the gradient. And uh, first we get the maximum absolute value of all the gradients. So that's like 1.2 here, the maximum absolute value. And we get the signs of all the gradients. So we want to know the directions of all the, of all the gradients. And finally, we draw a binary code from a Bernoulli distribution. So that's the binary code. So for each gradient, for each gradient element, it follows a Bernoulli distribution and its probability of being one is the absolute value over the maximal uh, absolute value. So yes, yeah, so for, for example, uh, its probability of being one will be 0.3 over the maximum absolute value. So we have the Bernoulli distribution, we draw from the Bernoulli distribution, we get a binary code and then we multiply all of them. Then we can get our ternary gradients. And so each value here only have three discrete, discrete values. So we can uh, quantize them to like two bits and we only need to send one single floating uh, value over the network. So it, we can achieve the uh, communication reduction. Uh, if, if we do some math, the expectation of the quantized gradients is still unbiased. So it's the original gradient. And that's why it works, works pretty well. And then we prove the convergence on the some, some assumptions. Um, yeah, we did a lot of experiments in the paper, but I will do a quick summary here. So for ImageNet classification tasks on a system with on a system with uh, like Ethernet and the PCI switch with more than 16 GPU, we can achieve uh, four times speed up for AlexNet uh, without accuracy loss. For uh, GoogleNet, we achieve two times speed up. But yeah, we observe some accuracy loss, but it's less than 2%. And uh, uh, this method is adopted by uh, Facebook AI Infra to train in the uh, recommendation system and the ranking models. And uh, we didn't observe accuracy loss um, by using a higher precision. So like four bit or eight, bit, eight bits. And yeah, it's open sourced in the repertoire. So this concludes my second part to make the distributed training faster. Any uh, maybe questions if I move to the third part? If no, then I'll continue on the third part on uh, structurally sparse models. Mm. So, so here is the like popular method by Professor Han on um, connection pruning. So basically they can remove connections um, without sacrificing the um, accuracy. Uh, it can significantly reduce the storage size of new network and it can get good speed up with customized hardware. However, um, back to the old days when I, uh, we implement this method on general platform like CPU or GPUs, um, the story is totally different. So I when I implement it on GPU, although I can achieve a pretty high I, uh, sparsity, <clears throat> some layers is, has even more than like 95% of sparsity, which means 95% um, weights are all zeros. However, when we do the computation using cool sparse, the speed is pretty limited. Um, sometimes it's even slower. 
Why? <coughs> this is because um, the sparsity is non-structured. It uh, has pretty bad data locality and it breaks the um, parallelizability in the modern hardware because modern hardware, hardware are, are usually good at um, one block of computation. And so it so so our result won't be good because of the um, poor data locality. So um, my, one of my research is on structured sparsity. So the motivation is uh, instead of uh, we move um, weights in a non-structured way, um, can we remove uh, weights in a structured way such that the <clears throat> The, the pattern is still friendly to our hardware. So in terms of the architecture, basically instead of remove like connections, we can remove uh, architectures like neurons, filters, or even layers. And uh, <clears throat> here is the, the comparison of this speed up um, versus sparsity and then, and the blue line is for non-structured sparsity, and the and the orange line is for structured sparsity. As you can see, because structured sparsity is more friendly to have uh, to uh, hardware, then it can scale much better. And we name our method as uh, structured sparsity learning, or an SSL, in short. So here I'll just briefly show our uh, result um, on some experiment. So, and this one is the uh, comparison of SSL over <coughs> non-structured method. So we can get two times speed up with the same accuracy. And uh, our method can also be applied to remove like layers, residual network. So we can reduce the depth of the network uh, without um, sacrificing the accuracy. And we also um, generalize our method to um, uh, recurrent new networks and the attention, attention based models. And uh, yeah, it also works pretty well. So for example, this one is the um, test of perplexity um, fit off with the size of the model. So when perplexity is smaller, which means better, <clears throat> and SSL can make a better trade off um, here. And, it's, yeah, and similarly for other type of models. <clears throat> and uh, our recent research on uh, like Deep Hoyer also advanced the state of art um, uh, model comp compression. So, and here, the blue circles are all the previous works, and uh, the red dots are deep hole year, and we can we can make a better trade-off between the flops reduction and uh, the um, accuracy. Yeah, I think this this conclude uh, like my previous research. Before move in, move on. Yeah, if any questions, feel free to ask. And yeah, um, I think there are also still quite a, like open research problems in the field. <clears throat> and one thing is on the connections between the sparse new networks, lottery, lottery tickets hypothesis, and also um, like neural architecture search. <clears throat> So a lot of tickets hypothesis uh, says that for a dense forward new network, it contains some sub networks or like sparse networks. <clears throat> they call winning tickets. When those sub networks train from scratch, they can reach the same accuracy using the same um, number of iterations. This is great. That means um, there exist some sparse networks that we can train from scratch. Unfortunately, okay, unfortunately in the paper to find the sub-networks, 
they have to train the network from scratch using connection pruning to find the subnets. So that will, that won't make any sense because we to find the network, we need to train the whole network from scratch. So it cannot save any training time. <clears throat> and so um, one of my friends did a apply on SSL to um, to speed up the training process. So um, our, observe, our, our experiments show that SSL can identify the winning tickets in the early stage. So basically, we can remove some architectures at the very early stage. So we can train a smaller and a smaller model. In this way, we can achieve 40 times training time reduction for a ResNet 15 for ImageNet. And uh, <clears throat> another connection is on NAS with weight sharing. Um, so basically for NAS with weight sharing, the goal is to find a sub networks. So, I mean, um, basically we can also use uh, pruning to do the neuro, neuro architecture search. And there are some interest connections to um, lottery tickets hypothesis. And another, another general research problem that I'm interested in is like, can we build a monolithic model for ATI? So, so here is the story. So we human, our brain evolves for many years. So, and the, a baby will just in, inherit um, brain structure and the potential knowledge from our parents. And if I just learn a few examples, then human have quite high intelligence. And recent, recent research on GPT are indicating that it is possible to build a monolithic model for each act. So basically, um, OpenAI built a GPT model, which is a pretty large model, and they train this model using large amount of uh, corpus data. And the uh, um, GPT model all share the same main attention structure. And optionally, by fine tuning a few examples, GPT can perform multitask learning. So, um, so can we build a monolithic model which evolves over time and it, it's trained by zillions of data. And now next we have a baby model to share the architectures and parameters from the monolithic model. And by simply fine tuning um, a few examples, then we can achieve ETI. Of course, it's not an easy task, and we need to tackle a lot of like research problems. So first thing is like efficient deep learning, of course, because the model is pretty large, then we need to train it uh, efficiently. And we need on supervised learning because um, we don't need, we don't have that amount of labeled, labeled data. And uh, the model should be trained with in a life learning, lifelong learning style and transfer learning is important. And the neural architecture evolution search growth and pruning are all important because we want to evolve the architecture of the new network. And multitask learning is also important. So um, our uh, early effort on KDD last year um, we propose an algorithm called AutoGrow, which try to adapt the depths of the network to different data set. So, and we show that even when the data set grows, um, our um, AutoGrow can adapt the network to a new data set. More details are in the paper. And uh, at last, uh, last um, research that I start to find interesting is uh, recommend data and the ranking systems. 
nowadays when we talk about AI systems, uh, we may we may talk about like fancy applications of like self-driving car and face recognition or other like GAN. However, the two most significant AI systems in the world is not it's not that fancy. It's just the Google search engine and the social media's uh, recommend data systems. And uh, those two models basically are all ranking and or recommend data models. And if we look at uh, Facebook AI's compute footprint in the whole infra, 50% uh, of the training is used to train uh, recommend data uh, models and 80% of the inference time is used for um, inference of uh, recommend data systems. So that's the opportunity in industry. However, uh, in the academia, uh, when we, we check the um, publication, like in machine learning system community, 82% is for computer vision and 60% is for NLP and only 2% is for recommend data systems. So there is a huge gap here, which means there is a huge opportunity here. So I find that it's also quite interesting. And I think that concludes my talk. Yeah, and if you have any questions, feel free to communicate with me. Let me stop sharing my screen. Uh, thank you, Wei. Thank you for a very uh, excellent talk. So actually, we have the one question from the chat box from the Yi Han. So okay, I see. Question? Oh, yeah, I saw that. So the question is, how about Prune or SSL trained model? Can pruning or SSL trained model benefit from the structured sparsity introduced by SSL. Um, how about prune? Um, so, so the goal of SSL is basically trying to prune filters and the channels. So, I mean, SSL already can prune the models. Why, why do we need to prune again? Um, maybe E can clarify that. So yeah, basically uh, SSL is for printing and uh, after it converges, it will find the, um, the best model to make the trade-off between accuracy and uh, uh, computation. Uh, thank you for the uh, clarification. So my question is basically, uh, after the SSL training, can we further uh, prune the model? Can we make it like more sparse um, by applying pruning to it? Mm. Mm. Our, our goal is SSL is more like a one shot. So we train from, train from the beginning and after the convergence, it will um, it will converge to a good model. Um, basically, uh, if we prune the model again, that means it's more like um, increase the number of pruning steps. Mm -hmm. So I think yes, if we if we uh, prune like less aggressively, uh, it will have a better trade off. But it will it will uh, include the uh, total time. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hi, wait. I have another question. Sure. Uh, I think I have already asked a lot of questions. <laughs> Thanks oh, for your very what? nice talk. And I have a question on slide uh, twenty eight. Slide 10. 28. Okay. So on slide 28, when you uh, consider the quantization without bias, so can we understand it as a as the extension of the stochastic rounding to the to the ten case? Yes, yes. 
I see. And also, uh, when you do the distributed learning, so how did you how did you allocate, for instance, uh, the the training data sample to to different nodes? So on the, on each node, do you have the same number of samples? Uh, yes, it's a it's a standard uh, distributed uh, training setting. So so each worker have the same. Uh, they yeah they, they they have the same amount of data to be trained. I see. Um, but I mean, there is no overlap between those workers. Okay, so basically, if you have decided to assign those data sample to a worker, and then you just don't change the data sample on that worker, right? Correct. Correct. I see. I see. Thank you. And uh, we have another questions in the chat box, right? Oh yeah. Not familiar with recommendation but could you provide some interesting research directions or paper for this area? Um, yeah, 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 I think um, for, for research directions, um, I mean, it's more, it's more like a application, new application domain. And uh, uh, they should share machine learning, te machine learning techniques uh, it's similar to like from computer vision to NLP problem. Um, so the general techniques will, will be shared, but yeah, I think there are some like difference. So for example, maybe different prior on the architecture and um, yeah. And for papers, um, I think the first paper on deep learning for Recommended system is Google's white and uh, deep, white and deep learning. Yeah, I'll tap it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Hi, Dr. Wen. Um, uh, you said that you can, you know, uh, use quantization to lower down the communication volume of the training phase, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, have you ever thought about combining the uh, quantization and also the some sp uh, sparse techniques for training, like you know, uh, lottery tickets or the early birth, so that you can uh, combine the quantization and the sparsity to to uh, further lower down the communication overhead in the training? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Yeah, um, combine sparsity and quantization will be uh, more beneficial. I think Professor Han also had their follow-up uh, paper on uh, deep, gra deep, deep gradient compression. So that, that paper is on, on sparse um, gradients over the network. Yeah, thank you. And I, uh, I, I want to see that, you know, uh, the sparsity is usually, you know, uh, applied for inference. So do you have uh, uh, some, uh, some recommendation papers or ideas about how to, uh, how to use the sparsity during the training, right? So yeah. you can, yeah. Yeah, for our paper, so basically, uh, as in introduced in the very end, we have a paper on pro, pro train to make the training fast. Um, and that's that's one paper. And uh, uh, after the paper on uh, lottery tickets hypothesis, I think there are a lot of efforts uh, to identify sparse networks at early stage to make the training faster. So a quick way is just to check the citation of the uh, um, like lottery tickets hypothesis paper and the search they highly cited the paper, then that, that would be a good source to restart, to start. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so last one small questions. Do you think the quantization and the sparsity will affect each other, to, you know? Mm, I think yes, because both will sacrifice the learning capacity. Mm, so if, if you use, 
let's say if you just use sparsity, then you can reach your high sparsity. Um, and if you combine sparsity with quantization, then I expect the sparsity will be lower, but, but you have a benefits from the quantization. So, um, I mean, it will have a benefits from the both world, world but there was they will they will conflict because they sacrifice the uh, learning capacity of the model. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think there is one more question in the chat. Yes. Um, what's the output of the GCN used in NAS? Does it predict the training time of the network? Um, so far, the, the output is just the accuracy, the predicted accuracy. And we, we didn't include um, inference time in, in the model, but I think there is a paper from Facebook, which is a Facebook FBNet v3, and um, the first, um, the first pre-train the predictor um, by predicting the uh, like parameter of the model or the flops of the model. So they can first pre-train the model and then use the pre-train, um, then fine tune the pre-trained model um, to predict the accuracy um, because they have, so for pre-training they have, we have a, a lot of data because the flops are easy, much easy to be obtained. But for accuracy, it's more difficult because we need to train a lot of models. So that's, yeah, that's that's one related paper. So that's FB net V3. Yeah. Another one is, do you use a di directed graph so that we can know the exact sequence of the layers? Mm, yes, we used the we used directed graphs. So basically, uh, as I show in the slides, we have a um, directed graph, and then we have a transpose of a direct, directed graph. Then we use the average of the features from the both part to, to do the um, prediction. Hey, wait, I have a question uh, regarding the like the neural architecture search. So mm -hmm. uh, is it possible, do you think that there are many uh, like uh, real applications which have uh, which have like a lot of uncertainty? For example, there might be some data actually arrive, let's say thousand data arrives. And uh, sometimes it may have like a uh, hundred data available. So which means that the, in some applications, the data arriving I mean, uh, or the data availability may be quite different. So what if like uh, I have a pre-trained model? So now I want to adapt the model to the new application domain, but uh, the problem is that data is always unreliable or like uh, uh, sometimes maybe it's thousand data available. Sometimes it may be like, let's say uh, 500 or 100. So do you think uh, neural architecture search, or uh, do you think is there any way that we can like uh, uh, like uh, better tolerate this, uh, better handle this kind of situation? Yeah, because it's quite normal, I think, in the especially in the networking. So you have sensors, right? So basically, sensor data may not be always available. So I mean, mm -hmm. so how do you quickly adapt? You know, the running to the new situation, considering when there is a data uncertainty there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, I think it's quite related to um, like neural, neural growth um, when the data change, changes. And uh, yeah, basically if we, you have a smaller amount of data, then you may just need a smaller network. And after you have more and more data coming up, then um, we can grow the network. And uh, yeah, one work is what we did on the auto grow. And uh, there are also some like research um, to, on neural growing. So it can do like lifelong learning. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. There's another questions in the chat box. Okay. 
Are there any good approaches recommended for identifying good subnetwork in very early stage, like without training or fine tuning, or just very few epochs of training? Mm, yeah, there are there are a lot of like emerging methods. Um, yeah, mm, and yeah, if we check the like. Um, citations of the not take hypothesis um yeah i think there are a few uh there's some papers on working on that um, yeah so basically most method that gradient are gradient based so it's more like applying pruning method at the early stage yeah And there's a questions from the audience. Hello, don't don't quite I think you are muted. Uh, how about now? Yeah, good. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Right. Hi, wait. Uh, great presentation. So, uh, can I have one question about the the lottery ticket and the NAS? So, yeah. my question is that so um, so my understanding is that NAS focus on the neural level. So, up uh, no the, the NAS focus on the like the module level. So, you want to find out some the the, the subject work from the original one. However, the lottery ticket is kind of the the, the neural level. It wants to find some the sparse the 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 the, the the sparse, the sparse thing, the, the neural level. So I, I, I see that you in your slides you mentioned about the one direction is kind of the combination of the lottery ticket uh, with the nest. So could you elaborate more on that point? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, actually, uh, so there are some paper. So one paper is on uh, zero cost your architecture search. Um, it borrows the idea of like um, it borrows the idea of some methods which trying to identify the early the early tickets at early stage of, for the surface networks. Um, yeah, and it, it works um, for new architecture search. Uh, wait, so which paper do you mention? Uh, uh, zero zero cost NAS. Yeah. Oh, I see. And I think another paper is Zen, Zen, Zen Ness. Yeah, uh, I, I hope I can tap in here. Thank you. So you mean you mean that the, for example, like the zero NAS, uh, it uh, utilized so it combined the the NAS architecture uh, NAS approach with the with the like the lottery sparsity. So um, so it's like this. So after the uh, Lot of tickets hypothesis. There are a lot of work trying uh -huh. to identify the winning tickets at the early stage, uh -huh. and the and the zero cost NAS paper basically borrow those ideas, um, so it can identify sub networks at the early stage to perform the um, earning to perform like zero cost search. So if it, if you think about um, sparse new networks basically um, the goal is also to find the sub networks um, uh, without sacrificing the accuracy and uh, in NAS basically um, the goal is also to identify sub networks with a good accuracy so basically they apply um, uh, those um, pruning a lot of tickets hypothesis methods to NAS so they can identify good uh, network at the very, very beginning without the training the network. So that's why they call it like zero cost. I see, I see, I see. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions from the audience?
So let's thank Wei for your very excellent talk and uh, your talk uh, you. inspires a lot of the, the very interesting discussions. And uh, also thank you very, thank everyone to attend our this week progress in fishing and stamina talk. And then let's meet next week. Okay, thank you Wei. Thank you everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. See you folks. Bye. Bye.